Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are. Welcome back to this third day of our school. Uh, we are talking about X-ray Chandra with Juan Rafael Martinez Galarza, the scientific chief of uh, this amount of data that is extremely interesting, and who is telling us how to work with the data and how to understand what is uh, coming from this amazing telescope. Juan Rafael, how are you? Good morning, Esteban. Thank you very much for having me again. And good morning to everyone following the lectures. Uh, I'm ready. I'm ready to talk about uh, X-ray spectra and how to get physical information from X-ray binaries and ultraluminous uh, X-ray sources today. Perfect. We are happy to have you here. And uh, if you start your sharing of the PDF, I can upload yes. the screen. I will do that now. Do you see okay. the presentation now? Yeah, now we are seeing the presentation. I'm just going okay. to presentation mode. Yes, so you you're in presentation see. mode and we are seeing your mouse. So the space is yours, Juan, and thank you very much. All right, thanks. So good morning again. And uh, let's go with lecture three of this series. Uh, today, I am going to be telling you a little bit about fitting models to data. Uh, this is uh, another fundamental aspect of, of what we do to scientists. As scientists, I would say this is probably the most fundamental thing we do uh, as scientists, comparing models and hypotheses to actual evidence. And I am going to do that in the context of spectral features of certain types of X-ray sources that we have plenty of da data of uh, in the Chandra, uh, in the Chandra uh, telescope. So uh, let me just start first by telling you a little bit of what we did last lecture yesterday. It, I know it was a little bit dense. We did a lot of bit of uh, probabilistics and statistics, uh, but I wanted to, you know, take home only a few messages from that lecture. Uh, basically, the first thing we learned yesterday was about two different philosophical approaches to probability. The meaning of probability uh, of the frequentist, as for which probability is seen as the result of repetition of an experiment and the frequency with which you observe a result versus the Bayesian interpretation of probability in which model parameters themselves are random variables that have associated probabilities to them. And that probability is associated to the degree you believe that uh, particular model has a parameter. Uh, so that's kind of the central message from yesterday lecture. And we saw that the posterior probability distribution that combines any previous belief you had about a particular parameter in a model with any new evidence that you have, uh, you know, is itself a probability density function. And as such, you can use it to measure the full uncertainty of your, of your, uh, of your model parameter. So all you need when you evaluate a model is to have the posterior probabilities of its parameters, and that will tell you all, all the probabilistic information about how certain you are, you are about that particular value. And we applied this Bayesian framework to the problem of inferring the flux of X-ray sources from a number of observed counts. So all you have is a number of uh, photons, X-ray photons that have detected uh, that have been detected by by the telescope, and what you and what you do is you apply Bayesian statistics to infer a model, uh, a flux model for those uh, particular observations. And we also discussed actually how the importance of doing those measurements in X-ray astrophysics, for example, in modeling phenomena such as kilonova. And when we when we measure the flux of something like a kilonova, we can start thinking about models that explain that flux. And the the starting point, of course, is being able to accurately measuring those flux. But an important question that we're going to try to answer in today's lecture is how do we actually tell which model is better over which other models? When you have a number of different models that you're trying to apply to the same data, how do you do that? And that's why you, know, you need to do model comparison you know, in the light of uh, existing evidence. It's a, and that's what we're going to be talking about today a little bit. So in this lecture, we will learn a bit more about astrophysics, of course, and we're going to start with some motivation and X-ray binaries, ultraluminous X-ray sources, as well as their spectral properties. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about these fantastic objects that basically hide the most massive, uh, on the most, some of the most energetic stellar mass uh, objects in the universe. 
uh, we will learn how to use statistics in order to compare our models of nature, in this case, our models of X-ray binaries, with the data that we obtain for tel from telescopes, for example, from the Chandra Space Observatory. And we will learn how to evaluate how good a particular fit of a model is to a particular set of data, given some assumptions. And we will learn how to deal with very complicated posteriors. If you have a physical model of an X-ray binary and you have a complicated posterior for the parameters that you cannot calculate analytically, well, I told you yesterday, you can sample from it. And there's a sophisticated, sophisticated methods to do that. And we're going to talk a little bit about MCMC sampling today. And uh, in the practical session, which today is going to be a little bit longer because I've, I'm figuring that I've been talking a lot uh, during these lectures and I haven't given you really the opportunity to do a little bit of your own play. In the practical session today, we will uh, extract uh, a, a, a spectrum for, of, of a ULX from the Chandra source catalog. We will visualize that spectrum and we're going to fit it using Bayesian statistics and a particular tool for Bayesian fitting of X-ray spectra. So I hope this is going to be a fun uh, ride today. And as always, please either ask your questions at the end of the lecture or write them down and then send me a message after the lecture, okay? So I'm gonna start talking today uh, about X-ray binaries. I've mentioned these guys in the past, but today I want to focus a little bit more on, on what they actually are. And what you see here is of course an artistic depiction uh, of what's actually we believe what's actually happening uh, in, a, in, a, in a system like this, basically there is a compact object here, which can be either a black hole or a neutron star or even a white dwarf, a very compact object that happens to have a companion. And that's not very rare in the universe for the simple reason that stars are often born uh, together in groups or in pairs, etc., etc. So having a binary star is not so rare. And when, when one of the two stars is very massive, it can end its life much quicker than the companion star and also end it in the form of a compact object. And when that happens, uh, a possibility, of course, is that if the star, the companion star gets close enough, the gravitational pull from the center uh, of the massive object will start uh, accreting material into the central object and that accreting material forms typically a uh, accretion disk that's, that gets very heated up uh, by, uh, of course, the emission from the central object in case it's a neutron star, or simply by the acceleration of particles as they go in for, as they infall into the central object, and that produces X-ray emission. And of course, often there's also these jets that are collimated jets that often are related to the accretion process itself. And this is typically what happens in a uh, system like this. These are one of the most common emitters of X-rays in the universe, and in particular in this galaxy. And we will uh, learn a little bit more about them in this lecture. So what happens uh, when there is accretion? Remember that in the first lecture, I told you that early X-ray astronomers were trying to figure out why stars emitted X-rays. And of course, there's a number of reasons uh, but among the most energetic uh, emitters of X-rays, people thought they were uh, they, they had to be either pulsars, which is basically a, a highly magnetic neutron star that is rotating very rapidly and that produces X-rays, or it could be an accretion-powered event. And we know that for most of the X-rays, X-ray binaries that we see in the universe, accretion is the main uh, mechanism behind the emission of X-rays. And that's produced basically by the infalling material from the donor star into the compact object. So there are, the, the, there are basically two main mechanisms uh, that uh, explain most of the emission in these X-rays binaries, at least in the most general case. Either uh, it's Compton scattering by the, uh, by the electrons uh, in the accreting plasma. Basically, remember, there's, there's lower energy photons, for example, UV photons or infrared photons, and they get scattered by these very energetic electrons and they gain energy and get transformed into X-rays or thermal emission from the accretion disk itself. So if you look at the figure here on the bottom right, you see a diagram of how this uh, accretion disk uh, you know, is located with respect to the central object. And you see that there's, there's a couple of elements. There's the, 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 the massive object in the center itself, the neutron star or the black hole, 
There's a companion star from which material is being accreted. There's, of course, the accretion di disk itself, but there's also a hot corona of electrons that heat up to very, very high temperatures, the surroundings. It's like, it's like if the disk has a little atmosphere of hot plasma. And uh, when we look through this uh, system, what we mostly see is the emission that is coming either from the Compton scattering produced by the electrons in this plasma or by the thermal emission of the accretion disk itself. Uh, and of course, uh, these objects have a range of luminosities. So if you see here from this paper from Graham Gilfamov and Sonyaev from 2002, you see uh, that there is two types of uh, X-ray binaries that I am about to introduce, but this is just telling you the luminosity functions of these objects. And the luminosity functions is basically just a histogram of how many of these objects have luminosities of 10 to the 35, how many have luminosities on 10 to the 36, et cetera, et cetera. So you see there's a decrease for low mass X-ray binaries and a decrease also for high mass X-ray binaries. And the decrease is not exactly behaving exactly the same. But what we know is that typically the range of fluxes of these objects goes from about 10 to the 35 ergs per second to 10 to the 39 ergs per, se ergs per second. That's kind of the typical range of luminosities that you would expect from this kind of objects uh, in the galaxy and outside of our galaxy. And as a result of this process I was explaining here with the disk of the scattering of, uh, of photons uh, uh, by high energy electrons in the corona, and the thermal emission, black body emission from the disk itself, and in some cases also thermal emission, black body emission from the surface of the neutron star itself. Uh, as a result of that, typically the spectra of these objects have two components, a thermal component that is here depicted, depicted in blue in this uh, figure here that uh, relates to the thermal emission from the disk of the system. And then there's also a non-thermal component. And remember that non-thermal component tends to be described by this power law uh, kind of uh, uh, function. Uh, and this is related to typically to the scattering and the quantum scattering of the photons by the uh, electrons. So typically you have these two elements. And from each of those two elements, you can construct different physics. For example, if you can model the disk uh, if you can model the thermal emission of the disk, you can constrain things like its temperature, right, of the, of the accretion disk, but also its inner radius. Because, for example, if your, if, your, uh, if your central object is very massive, it will have uh, a lot of radiation and it will uh, make the uh, accretion will stop, will stop at a, at a farther away from the, from the object that in a, in, a, in, a, in a central object that is less massive. And therefore, how close the disk is to the central object will control the temperature of the disk as well. And then you'll be able to constrain also the geometry of the disk. As for the non-thermal component, the physics that you can, uh, that you can uh, try to constrain by uh, uh, looking into the properties of the non-thermal emission is basically the slope, the slope of this power law that will tell you about the distribution, the underlying distribution of the electrons that are producing the Compton scattering. For example, are they more or less energetic? Are they being ejected in a, in a jet as they are they mostly in the jet, that, uh, that, uh, that collimated jet that forms in the accretions process or are they mostly you know, living in the corona quietly on the disk? So those are the physics that you can constrain when you look at the spectra. And by the way, what I'm showing you here is an actual Chandra spectrum. This is the energy between 0.3 or so and 10 uh, kilo electron volts. And this is basically uh, the, the photon counter you get. So this is basically a spectrum in X-rays of the object that, that has been fitted in this case with this combined model of the two things. And here in the bottom right, you see a simplified kind of version of the accretion disk. And why is it that you expect it to thermally emit uh, X-rays? Well, because it gets really, really hot as you get close to the uh, accretion flow that goes into the black hole this will be very, very hot material and it, that emits the X-rays. On the other hand, as you go away from the disk, the disk can also emit visible light and ultraviolet, infrared, etc., etc. And it, it is these infrared photons and these visible photons that get scattered away by the corona electrons that live in the atmosphere of the, this disk to produce the non-thermal component. All right?
So that's kind of the basic uh, spectral signatures of, uh, of an accreting system. And as I have just mentioned, well, these X-ray binaries happen to be panchromatic. They emit not only in the, in the X-rays, both soft and hard, uh, but actually they emit across the entire wavelength range all the way from the radio to the, to the X-rays. And radio is mostly emitted by the jet, you know, the corona, which is the atmosphere of this disk with all those very hot electrons that emits mostly hard X-rays. The accretion disk and sometimes the surface of the neutron star itself, if what's in the center is a neutron star, emits softer X-rays because those are thermal. And in some cases, we can even see the companion star. This, this can actually be the case. If the companion star is bright enough, we can actually see it in infrared or optical data. So this is how uh, we get all sorts of electromagnetic radiation from these kind of systems. And now let me introduce to you the two types of X-ray binaries uh, that we know of. So, uh, and again, as most things in astronomy regarding the evolution of stars, it all depends on the mass. But in this case, the properties of whether you class classify something as a low mass binary or, or, or a high mass X-ray binary depends not, in the, not on the mass of the central object, but on the mass of the donor star, the companion star that is providing the material uh, to it. So here, in this case, the high mass X-ray binary refers to the fact that the companion star is a massive star, typically, say, three or four times the, the, the mass of the sun, whereas in the case of low-mass low, X, low mass X ray binaries, the companion star is typically a solar mass star or even smaller than the sun. And there are some interesting differences between these two systems. And let me start with some proper, pro, uh, uh, observational properties. For example, uh, most of the high mass X-ray binaries are seen in the galactic plane and actually close to star forming regions. And if you know, and if, if, if I was actually with you guys in the room, I would, I would ask you the question, what, can, you, can, you, can you tell me why you think these objects are mostly close to star forming regions? And because I cannot ask you, I will just answer the question myself. The reason is that uh, high mass stars are short lived. So typically, if you're going to have a massive star that is giving the material to, uh, to the black hole to be accreted, uh, that star has to be young because it's a massive star and massive stars don't live too long. So typically, you will not find these high mass X-ray binaries too far away from where stars are actually being formed because these, form these stars, these massive stars are systems that uh, formed relatively uh, recently. So uh, on the other hand, most of the low mass X-ray binaries live closer to the galactic bulge in, in a particular galaxy. And that's where the old population of stars are. And that's kind of expected again, because that's where you have kind of the low mass stars that live for longer. And that's also where there's a little bit more of density uh, of stars, where, for example, the capture of a, of a, of a low mass star gravitational capture of a low mass star by a black hole or a neutron star is more likely. It's not, it's not that it always gets captured. Sometimes they just evolve themselves together. But in, in very dense environments, what can happen is that there's an existing black hole or neutron star, and then there's a passing uh, stars nearby that gets captured in orbit around this object. X-ray, uh, high mass X-ray binaries tend to have uh, a, a harder X-ray spectrum. Uh, with respect to low mass X-ray binaries. And that's related to the fact that the accretion flows from high mass stars that have typically stronger stellar winds, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, happen, uh, you know, produce a much larger accretion rate that tends to pump up the, uh, the uh, power low part of the spectrum. And then the, hard, the, the, the spectrum becomes harder. Uh, and in, in the case of high mass X-ray binaries, you typically see pulsations. So if you study the light curve of these objects, how it changes in time, you will see that there's some, some uh, uh, kind of pulsations like the ones you see here. And those are typically due to uh, magnetically funneled accretion into the poles of the, the central object. Whereas in the case of low mass X-ray binaries, rather than pulsations, you see some pulsations as well, but you see a lot of bursts. 
And that's basically due to instabilities in the accretion disk that sometimes produce episodes of very high accretion that will create this kind of light curve where the, uh, the, a very intense accretion event will lead to a very intense uh, increase of the brightness in the X-ray in the X-ray data. All right. So this is kind of the basic uh, the basics of uh, X-ray binaries. But it turns out that sometimes I told you that typically the range of uh, luminosities that we observe for these objects is between 10 to the 35 and 10 to the 39. But as as it so happens, uh, there are cases where we actually find objects in the spiral arm of galaxies, like in the case of this object that you see here, where there's a very, very bright, uh, a very, very bright uh, X-ray source. And that source is so bright that, as I, as I have explained uh, previously, it exceeds the Eddington limit for a 10 solar uh, normal star. So uh, the, the Eddington limit for a 10 solar mass black hole is about 10 to the 39 er ergs per second. Anything that is beyond that, it's either accreting at super Eddington luminosities with some kind of physical mechanism, or is a more massive central has a more massive central object. So these objects called the ULX and so ultra luminous X-ray sources and hyperluminous X-ray sources. We, we call something a hyperluminous X-ray source if its brightness in the X-ray is if its luminosity in the X-ray is larger than 10 to the 42 X per second. That's extremely, extremely bright. In fact, this guy here is one of those objects that has been spotted. In a, in a galaxy, and as, as you see, this is the location of the object. And this object here, the X-ray counterpart, has of the order of uh, above, it's above 10 to the 42 X per second. These objects were first discovered by the Einstein satellite. If you remember the first lecture I talked about Einstein, it was the first imaging telescope in X-rays, and it was the first one to focus these very luminous objects. Uh, but now, thanks to Chandra and also XMM-Newton and many other interesting X-ray missions, we know at least you know, a few hundreds of these ULXs and HLXs. And they're a very interesting set of objects because the, uh, the, the, the properties of their physical, the, the physical properties are actually very hard to infer. Uh, uh, in fact, I mean, as you, as you see here from uh, the equation from the lumi uh, Eddington luminosity, if you have an object uh, of 10 to the 42 Hertz per second, like this guy here, then this equation would imply that uh, the mass of the central object has to be of at least 10,000 solar masses. So that's not yet a supermassive black hole, but that's certainly not a stellar mass black hole either. So that's why these ULXs have been called to try to explain uh, or to try to uh, find evidence for intermediate mass black holes. The truth is that uh, in reality, because the definition of what an ULX is and an HLX is depends only on, on an observational fact, which is the luminosity that you're, uh, that you're observing in the X-rays, it's very unlikely that that's necessarily linked to the physical properties. Just It's not that they are defined in base of the, of the physical properties. They are just defined based on an observational quantity. And in fact, what probably happens is that there's more than one explanation as to why we see objects that, they are, that, that, that are so luminous. And we cannot just say, okay, they are all in, uh, uh, intermediate mass black holes or they are all stellar mass black holes that are emitting at super Eddington luminosities. There's probably a combination of the two. And in fact, those are the two main scenarios. Uh, the intermediate mass black hole scenario, that's most likely the explanation for objects like this because there is no way you can come up, you can take a stellar, uh, a solar mass type black hole, you know, with say up to 10 to the, uh, up to 10 solar masses. And there's no way you can get rich these luminosities, even if you do super Eddington accretion, that's, that's basically impossible. So, so this scenario that these objects are intermediate mass black holes are the most likely scenario for the most luminous objects. But the question is, how did they form? Uh, it's unlikely that they uh, form as the collapse collapses a single star because I don't think anyone has heard of a star that is 10,000 10, times the mass of the sun. Uh, perhaps what happens is that more than one star in very dense regions can coalesce uh, together and form a more massive star. Uh, and that has implications in cosmology. If these objects actually exist, 
can we think that perhaps the way in which supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies form is because several of these intermediate mass black holes uh, collide with each other. So that's, that's the, the intermediate mass black hole scenario. Then there's also the idea that maybe they are just stellar mass black holes, so smaller objects, smaller compact objects, but they are emitting beyond this limit. And there's some possibilities, there's some physical possibilities as to why they could emit beyond this limit. Uh, for example, uh, if there's inefficient accretion set, so not, not all of the accretion goes into X-ray luminosity, that could be a possibility, but also collimated beams. So for example, there's uh, the, the, when the radiation is not isotropic and we happen to see it as a, as a stream coming to us, but is not being uh, emitted equally in all directions, then that could be another way in which you could achieve such light, uh, such uh, large luminosity. But in, in reality, between these two scenarios, only detailed modeling can tell us what exactly is happening in these very luminous systems. And in reality, uh, in most cases, actually, uh, a combination of the two scenarios could provide the best explanations from the properties of these objects. Here's uh, an interesting object from a relatively recent paper. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, an object uh, that has been called uh, M86TULX1. So typically the nomenclature of these objects is the first, uh, the first part is just the name of the galaxy in which it was found. Then ULX means it's an ultraluminous galaxy and then the first one that has been detected in this galaxy. So that's why one. And this is an interesting object for several reasons. Uh, it is uh, ULX, certainly is above uh, the luminosity of the, the Eddington luminosity for a 10 solar mass star. So it's actually three times 10 to the 39x per second. And, uh, but what's interesting is that it's located in an elliptical galaxy. Uh, and this is odd. This is odd because you know, at, at these huge luminosities, you kind of, you, you would expect the central object to have, uh, you know, uh, to, and, and also the companion to probably be young objects and massive that could explain this kind of luminosity. However, this object was found in, a, in an old population of stars in an elliptical galaxy. And this, of course, challenges some of the possible explanations as to how these objects can form. Uh, but on top of the fact that it lives in a kind of different environment that you would expect, uh, if you actually do the spectral fitting like the people who wrote in this paper, who wrote this paper did, they find that the inner disk temperature is hotter than typical ULXs, but also cooler than galactic uh, X-ray binaries. So it seems to be an object that is not quite, and, and you see here in the, in the bottom plot here, what you see here is the temperature. Uh, that, that you can fit when you do a spectral fitting, you can obtain the temperature of the internal part of the disk. Remember that the disk is hotter closer to the black hole. So in this case, this is the temperature in that internal region. And here is the amount of soft emission. So how much of the emission is probably thermal. And ULXs follow this very nice correlation uh, in this space. And here are the, are, are the, the, these gray points here are the more normal X-ray binaries that are not ultra luminous. And you see that they behave differently. But this object kind of lives in between the two groups. It's kind of an outlier. And it's interesting, which uh, perhaps what it indicates is that what this indicates is that this object is some kind of transition, is transitioning between a stage of being a normal X-ray binary going into an ultra luminous state, perhaps because the amount of accretion has, uh, has uh, increased, uh, is increasing significantly. The most likely explanation that the authors of this paper find is that the accretor is likely a black hole with a mass of between 30 and 10 solar masses. So not quite big enough to be considered an intermediate mass black hole, but still with a significant size. The typical size of the black holes that are detected by gravitational wave emission, by the way. Uh, so the question is, uh, what is this object and how we can figure out? And of course, uh, it's this, that will take more observations, et cetera, et cetera. But you can start answering some questions by fitting spectral models to this object. So this is exactly what we're going to be doing in uh, the practical session later today. Uh, and 
and but but this is the perfect way for me to introduce you to the fundamental uh, activity of scientists, which I would say, well, apart from, uh, of course, spreading knowledge, I would say the the uh, the fundamental work we do is compare models to data, and that's not a simple thing. So, in the second uh, part of this uh, first uh, part of the lecture, I'm going to move on to uh, talk about fitting models to data and how. What does that mean? And what do we do when we want to feed a particular spectral model like this one to a bunch of spectral points? What is it that we're actually doing? How do we best interpret that? How do we actually extract knowledge from it? And that's what I want to tell you in the next uh, few slides. So fitting models to data, what, what is this about? So let's first define what is a model and what is data. So what is a model? A model is, a, is an abstract representation of reality. Is the framework of ideas and concepts from, from which we interpret our observations or experimental results. So it's a, con it's, it's, a, it's a set of ideas and concepts. That's the basic idea of a model. And as such, it is able to make predictions about reality. You, you create models because you, you want to predict what happens in reality. For example, there is a model of reality in which a coin that you throw uh, to the air and let fall will land he heads or tails half of the time. That's a model of reality, right? Your model of reality is the probability that it will land fails. But, but models can also be uh, more complex uh, than that, of course. But, but what I want to emphasize here is that models are not reality itself. Models are a set of ideas and concepts that we try, uh, that, we tr that, that we use to try to summarize the behavior of nature, but it's not nature itself reality itself it's actually not even accessible to us because our brain makes a complex model of our sensory uh, uh, kind of experiences to create reality but the models is as close as we can get to try to understand nature and that's what we do as scientists we create models and then we test those models against uh, data and statistics and probability of which you had a lot yesterday and I know you 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 don't you, you you enjoyed it, but maybe it was a little bit too much. But but the reason why you you had so much of it is because these are the tools that you use to test these models against the evidence against against the the actual observational evidence. Uh, so that's that's a model. So what is data? Well, uh, from the from the frequent frequent frequentist point of view, uh, there's there's an easy answer to what is data. Data is a sample from an existing population. So we assume that there is an ex existing population of events and when we take data we're just doing a random sampling of that distribution so the data would represent an underlying reality that we're trying to characterize the reality creates a distribution of events that we sometimes get to sample when we measure and we get samples of those distributions and in that sense data are just particularly samples generated from a from a distribution of probability and that distribution of probability has a particular shape and it has a parameter. So for example, in this plot that you have here, uh, you are trying to measure, uh, you know, the, the, speed, uh, the speed of a particular, uh, a particular person uh, as, a, as a function of distance. And you see that basically those data points, you can assume that they distribute as Gaussian, uh, as Gaussian uh, shapes at Gaussian distri uh, probability distributions and you're just sampling for, uh, you're sampling uh, events from those distributions and that's your data these are those are the samples from the underlying distribution that is created by nature right so uh, in order to know the the parameters that fully characterize these distributions we would need to have the full sample. We would need to take all of the all of the experiments in the world in order to fully characterize these uh, these uh, distributions. But we actually only have a sample. So all we can get is an estimate of the parameters that describe these uh, these distributions. And let me point out here that there's two different types of parameters when you do this kind of model fitting. There's parameters of the model. So those are the parameters of your of your model. For example, the probability that the coin will land heads, and that's a set of uh, parameters that describe your model. But then there's also the parameters of the distribution from which the data points are being generated. So these distributions from which you assume you're sampling your data also have a parameter. In this case, it would be kind of the center, 
and the width of these distributions, that would be the parameters. And when you, when we fit models to data, what we're trying to do is relate those two together, the parameters of your model to the actual parameters of these distributions, right? So let's go back to talk about the likelihoods and just for you to remember, likelihood is just a way to relate our model of reality to data, right? Remember that, 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 that the likelihood as we define it uh, is something that gives you the probability of a bunch of data being drawn if you assume a particular model, right? So for example, one possible model of reality would be star Aldebaran has a visible magnitude of 0 0.03. So that's basically uh, your uh, model of reality that you can test and you can get you can get the likelihood. If you assume that a lever and has this magnitude, then you can get the likelihood of obtaining certain photometric measurements when you measure the light of a lever and with a telescope. But there's more complex models. For example, X-rays observed towards a particular quasar are mostly due to synchrotron emission uh, and uh, in the presence of a magnetic field B. That's a model, right? And you take data to try to, uh, to uh, validate that model. So we can always test how likely the data that we observe, given a model uh, that has parameters lambda, how likely that th those data sets are. And the way we test how likely those data are, are by looking at the likelihood. And the likelihood, remember, is just the probability of getting a set of data points given a model that you are assuming, right? So for the frequencies view, the parameters, remember that they adopt fixed values and you are asking yourself the question, how likely is it that I will get this particular spectrum if my model of the quasar is this particular model that I described here? So you are asking yourself, how likely is it that I will actually get these data points if my model is correct? Uh, in fact, what you're trying to do is find the values of lambda that maximize this likelihood. And that's why one of the most common things we do uh, when we fit a model to a, uh, to a set of uh, data is doing maximum likelihood estimates. So what is maximum likelihood? Well, maximum likelihood estimate is basically a method that will allow you to maximize, to find the parameter of your model that maximize the likelihood of your data. So what model parameters best you know, are, are more agreeing with the distribution of data you have here. So this is a plot from yesterday where I was showing you different measurements of the flux. And we have, if we assume that these, uh, that these data points are Gaussian, then we know that the likelihood for a Gaussian looks like this. It's basically a, uh, basically a comparison between your predicted, uh, your predicted uh, fluxes and your observed, your predicted fluxes, the true flux, minus uh, you know a difference with the uh, with the observed fluxes divided by the error right and this is square so this has the shape of a gaussian that's that's why these errors are gaussian and this is the likelihood of getting these data points given that your model parameter has a particular given value so how do you maximize that well that's easy that's that's a gaussian that's a gaussian distribution you can just derive this expression and equal it to zero and if you do that you will get that, and then you, you solve for the flux, you will see that you get this expression. In the particular case where the errors are all the same, what you will get is that the, the maximum likelihood estimate for the flux is exactly the average between these points. And that's not very surprising, right? We have a Gaussian distribution of errors, and then we're gonna, we're gonna try to find uh, what's, uh, what is the most likely, the maximum likelihood value for the flux. So you take all these points and you average them together, provided that the weights uh, are the same. Otherwise, you need to do actually this operation, and then you will get uh, your maximum likelihood estimate. So that's what we do when we do model fitting. We're, doing, we're maximizing the likelihood of a particular data set uh, uh, yeah, given, uh, given a model that we have assumed. And that's exactly what we do in model fitting. So suppose you want to fit the spectrum of an X-ray source, or suppose you want to fit the spectral energy distribution of a star forming region or whatever model you have. And uh, this is, for example, this is an example of, uh, of a spectrum, optical spectrum or infrared spectrum that is being fitted to some data. And what are the elements of this uh, exercise of fitting data? Well, you have your data, of course, uh, that is defined and your data are basically your measurements or the flux 
in the different wavelengths. So you have flux that I'm calling y1, y2, etc., etc., for different lambda positions, so for different values of the wavelength. Uh, each of them has associated errors, sigma. The sigma one would be corresponding to the error of this data point, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and your model, whatever model you're applying here, depends on certain parameters, right? For example, those parameters can be the star formation rate, the, ma the stellar mass, the obscuration, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure that during, the, during your studies in, at uh, university, you've often used the chi-square minimization. They say, okay, you're going, to, you're going to try to adjust a model, then give me the chi-square value. And the chi-square value, again, is defined as the difference between uh, the observed value and a, 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 a model value squared divided by the sigma for that particular point squared. So this is exactly what comes from considering the maximum likelihood estimate of a normal distribution. So the reason why you use chi-square minimization is because that's basically minus the likelihood, man, minus the logarithm of the likelihood of a normal distribution of data points. So you are basically assuming that each of these points is a Gaussian distribution and you are maximizing that Gaussian distribution. And in order to maximize that likelihood, is the same as minimizing minus the logarithm of this distribution. And when you do min minus the logarithm of this distribution, what you get is a chi-square expression. So that's exactly what you do when you're doing chi-square fitting. You're maximizing the likelihood, but you're assuming, and that's important, you're assuming that the distribution of the errors is Gaussian. All right? Now, how do you uh, assess that your fitting is good? How do you assess if the fit to your model is good? Uh, well, this is what we call the chi-square test. Uh, and basically, you start from assuming a null hypothesis. So it's your base hypothesis. And that hypothesis, I mean, you're, you're trying to assess if the, if the fit of your model to your data is good. So what you need to assess is whether there is a difference between the distribution of your data points uh, and, the, and, and data points that are sampled from a Gaussian uh, distribution. So if that's the case, if those distributions are similar, if they are the same, then your model is probably right, correct? So how do we decide whether we accept or reject that, that hypothesis? Well, it turns out that because the, the sum of independent normal, uh, normal random variables and each point, each of the points that you're fitting here is a, is a random variable, the sum of them you know, will distribute, and the, the sum of the square of them will distribute as an as a, as a chi-square distribution. So it will have this particular shape. In fact, the specific shape of that distribution of chi-square values will depend on the number of degrees of freedom you have. You have that, you have different chi-square functions uh, depend on the numbers of degrees of freedom you have. But the basic idea is that you expect those chi-square values. If you repeat, If you repeat these measurements many times, if you take this spectrum once, then you take it again, then you take it again, and you uh, then look at the chi-square value for each of those experiments, then those chi-square values have to be distributed according to this distribution, right? Uh, and that's, of course, uh, assuming that those come from Gaussian errors. Uh, so if you then do another if you do a particular experiment and you get a chi-square value that live that lives very far away from the peak of this distribution then you can conclude that since it's very unlikely for you to get that value if your null hypothesis is correct then that probably means you should reject your model so basically what that means is that okay let's assume that you're right then your models are gaussian and that you have a chi-square distribution of that and uh, you're gonna give me the chi-square value that you got from your single particular fit and that that's chi-square value lives around here that means that your pro your model is probably wrong because it, it would be very unlikely according to this distribution to get that value whereas if the chi-square value falls around here uh that means perhaps that your model might be a good representation of your data so that's that's rejection of hypothesis based on a particular model and also based on a particular assumption of the, of, the, of the data, in this case, that they are distributed according to Gaussians. Uh, the assumptions you make when you do chi-square fitting, for example, are many, and you have to be careful about them. Uh, just to quickly mention them, 
Uh, first of all, as I've mentioned several times, you're assuming Gaussian errors. You're assuming that your measurement errors distribute as Gaussians. That's not always the case. In fact, I've shown you cases of the photometry where the distribution of probability doesn't look very symmetric. Uh, you're also assuming that your model is right. The likelihood, uh, basically you're assuming that, uh, that the, 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 the data points were actually drawn from a particular model. And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and you're also uh, assuming, because when you build the, the likelihood, you construct it as the product of the likelihood for each individual object. You're assuming, remember statistical independence, you're assuming that each of those points are uncorrelated to each other. And that's not always the case. In fact, in a spectrum, maybe you would expect that this point is maybe correlated to the next one because there's some kind of physical correlation between the two. So that's another assumption you make. And of course, you're not assuming any errors in your, in your X axis. You're not assuming necessarily an error in the wavelength axis when you do this exercise. So it has a lot of caveats, but overall, it's a simple way in which we can uh, assess the validity of a particular model when we fit with data. So I'm going to talk only for uh, five more minutes and then we'll break. Um, and then uh, depending on whether I'm able to give you my, I, I, it's, it's only a few more slides. So I think I'll be able to do that. So actually, why don't we do that since it's been 45 minutes? Uh, I want you to think a little bit about what I've said uh, so far regarding the uh, assumptions uh, of, uh, of uh, regarding everything regarding model fitting. And then after that, I'm going to talk tell to you about, I'm going to talk to you about how you deal with complicated posteriors. So once you get your posterior distribution for your model parameters, how do you get to calculate that posterior? How do you get to get a uh, sample from that posterior? And I'm going to introduce MCMC sampling. And that's going to be the last thing before we go to the practical session. So I'm going to leave it there. And we're going to break for, uh, I would say, uh, 10 minutes. So let's be back here in 10 minutes again. And then uh, we'll continue with the second part. All right. Thank you very much, Juan Rafael. I will just put your slides down for a minute. And uh, so, yes, as Juan Rafael said, uh, let's break for 10 minutes and we will be back at 10.57 uh, uh, a.m. Uh, I don't see any questions right now in the chat. So maybe when we come back and people digest a little bit of the information. Sounds good. Okay. So we will turn off our cameras and microphones and we will be back in 10 minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, so we are back after this 10 minute break. And uh, let's wait for Juan Rafael for one minute. So, okay, there you go. There is Juan Rafael. So, uh, can you share your screen, please? Yep. I'm going to do that now. Give me a sec. All right. So, let me know if you see it. Yes. Now you can see it as well. You're not in presentation mode yet. Uh, okay. All right. Here we are. Okay. There you go. Okay. All right. So let's let's continue. Um, uh, is it is is it better with the sound now, Stevan? Uh, okay. Yes. At, at, at this point, is it sounds uh, correct? But uh, yeah, uh, it's not that we didn't hear correctly. It was uh, some kind of a small noise in the background. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. So I just told you about uh, about X-ray binaries, about how fitting spectra uh, of X-ray binaries can tell us uh, about the physics of this system. And I I just told you also about what is it that you do when you try to, trying to compare models with data and to extract information from the evidence. And uh, and just to rephrase from yesterday yesterday's lecture, we've been talking a lot about the likelihood today. And from yesterday's lecture, you remember that uh, in the Bayesian view of the world, you can update any, you know, the, the reason why you use data is because you want to update your prior belief on a particular model or on a particular value of a parameter. And you update that with that likelihood that we just were talking about that you have to maximize, right? And the combination of those two things gives you the posterior, right? And the posterior is basically your fin final answer regarding all the, post all the potential uh, uncertainties that you have on a particular parameter. If you, if you give someone the posterior of a parameter, that's all the information that you can extract from your data and from your previous knowledge on a particular parameter. And we said yesterday that there is an interesting rule, the base rule, that relates your posterior to your likelihood via the prior, right? So you just multiply them together and get the posterior. But we also said yesterday that there was a quantity, uh, the uh, normalization uh, quantity here, that we are going to call the evidence, and we're going to call it Z. And that evidence is important when you are trying to compare models. So basically, do you ha you have several models that explain the same data, or or could be could be an explanation for the same data set? Then, in order to know which model is more likely to explain your data, you need to compare them. And this quantity that basically normalizes the Bayes rule is what you use to compare models. And so, if you are going to do a fitting exercise where you need to compare more than one model, then you need to use the evidence. The problem, of course, is that both the posterior, this quantity, and the evidence itself are typically very difficult to calculate because you have, you're doing this exercise in a multi-dimensional space of parameters. So how do you deal with that? Well, instead of trying to calculate exactly the likelihood, the, sorry, the posterior or the evidence, what you can do is you can get samples from it. So you have to come up with a mechanism that allows you to get samples. And then you, if you get enough samples of that parameter and you make the histogram of those samples, then that histogram will resemble your posterior as much as you can. So sampling can be done with MCMC methods. And I'm going to briefly introduce what those methods are in, in a few slides. So basically sampling is about trying to get a distribution right, of samples that looks like your posterior, right? Uh, and so uh, you, you've, you've already seen that you can fit a model and find the maximum of that distribution, but now you want to know the full thing. You want to know the distribution, how that distribution actually looks like. So Markov Chain Monte Carlo MCMC methods uh, provide you with a tool to do exactly that. And I'm going to briefly explain what they do. Basically, they work with a Markov chain. And a Markov chain is nothing but a sequence of states in which the next state only depends on your current state. So for example, if you have two possible uh, states here, E and A, and you have, uh, if, you're in, in, you, if you're in E, what happens next only depends on the fact that you're in E. So what's happening next is you get, you stay in the same state with 30% of your pro, of, of probability, or you move to the other state with 70% of probability. Whereas when you're in A, you can move to 
the, the other state with only 40% probability, or you can stay on the same state with 60% probability. So that's a Markov chain because it only depends on your current state. And if you do that many times, if you just drop a particle and start moving it according to these probability rules, eventually you will get a distribution of events of how often you're in A versus how often you're in E. And all you have to do with this uh, for, for sampling a posterior is you have to come up with a Markov chain like this, such that the distribution of outcomes looks like your posterior. And the way to do that is with the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, right? And basically the way, the way you construct a Markov chain from a posterior is you have the values, you can take, you can, a posterior is like a mountain and you can start anywhere on that, on that mountain and try to move around so that you are more often closer to where the, the, the probability is maximum and less often in places of that landscape where the probability is shallow. So in order to do that, all you have to do is start doing a, some, some sort of random walk. So you randomly decide to move from one place to another uh, and you decide whether you accept that proposed step based on a very simple rule. And the very simple rule that you apply is this rule that I'm uh, uh, putting here in, in this next slide. Basically, you start from somewhere. So imagine this is your landscape, right? This is your landscape, where you, the, the landscape of probability that you're trying to sample. And you start somewhere. And, and, and notice that this is a very complex shape. You know, it's, it's got a maximum here and a maximum here. And you want to start moving across this space uh, by uh, actually sampling. And the way you sample is you start somewhere. You have a proposal distribution that, that's basically the, the probability that you will move in any direction from your current state. And then you move. And if you move and you result in an area that is higher in probability, then you accept that move and then you stay there. But if you move and it's actually lower probability than when you were before, you accept that you don't always accept. You accept from a, uh, with a probability that is proportional to the values of the posterior here and here and to the values of the proposal distribution in the two locations. If you do that, and this is basically just a Markov chain, it's a statistical process, a random walk process in which you will accept always if you move to higher probabilities and only sometimes when you move to lower probabilities, that is guaranteed, that sampling is guaranteed to converge to your posterior. So if you do that carefully enough, you will be able to recover samples that look like your posterior. And that's what we do actually when we do a lot of what the things we do in astrophysics, when we try to extract models, uh, model parameters is we have our data, we have a posterior, and then the posterior is so complicated that what we do is we sample from it, right? And this is really what happens. Uh, you want to start somewhere and you want to start moving randomly in a way that eventually you will converge to a situation in which you are moving and you are spending most of your time in the region of the higher probability. And when that happens, those uh, steps that you accept, the values of the parameters you accept should look like this. It should look like you've converged to a value. And that's how your model seems to go. So this is basically, if this is a two model, this is a two model parameter because there's a, a two dimensional distribution, then you're moving randomly in this space. And for each of the two parameters, X and Y, you record a value. And if your Markov chain has converged, then you will see that it's a very nicely sampled. And if you get the histogram of these points, that will look, look like the posterior for that particular parameter. Okay, so that's what we do. And that's what we're going to do in the practical session to try to come up with parameters for the physical models that fit the spectra of X-ray binary. So I'm going to show you to do that. And before I do that, however, I will briefly introduce uh, a particular type of sampling, the nested sampling. And the nested sampling, and I'm not going to go into the details because I realize I don't have the time, but the nested sampling is basically a particular way of doing this sampling of the, of the posterior, where instead of trying to sample from the complete posterior of the from complete likelihood that is kind of uh, depicted here, what you actually do is you try to sample uniformly. You know, you start in a point, right? You, you jump to the next point, And then instead of trying to sampling to sample following this distribution, you try to sample from a uniform distribution with the condition that the likelihood has to be higher than the one that you have in this point. So we transform the problem of sampling something that is complex and, and, and has some kind of uh, shape here to sampling something that is flat. 
with a simple, simple condition that it has to be with likelihoods higher than the value you've obtained here. And then you, you move to the next point and you sample now from a new uniform distribution here. And as you do that, you can basically sample, sample very efficiently with the additional advantage that because you are uh, kind of calculating slices of the volume of this, uh, of this surface, you're also calculating the evidence. So at each sample, you're able to calculate that value of the evidence that you can actually understand as a prior weighted average of the likelihood. If you look at the expression for the evidence, what that's telling you is, okay, this is going to be the average of your likelihood over all model parameters, but it's going to be weighted by your prior. So if you, if you consider a prior and you can cite, consider all the likelihoods, you can get some kind of average likelihood over all model parameters. And that's why that's going to be a measure of how good the model is for this particular data set. So comparing the evidence for different models, you actually get to uh, estimate which of the models is better. So you would eventually want the evidence to be larger for models that are a better fit for your data than in models that are a worse fit for your data. All right. So what comes next, next is uh, uh, the, the practical session. And in the practical session, I'm going to show you how you can get data from the Chandrasource catalog in a Jupyter notebook, how you can uh, you know, obtain the tables for the properties of the tables. And I almost also going to show you how to get the spectrum of a particular source. And once you have that spectrum, I'm going to show you how to use nested sampling with a particular type of algorithm, uh, uh, the, the, this nested sample with a particular code in order to find the best fitting parameters for spectral models of X-ray binary. So I know it sounds a little bit complicated, but let's let's get to it, okay? So let me start with uh, the first notebook that I had here, which is uh, this one, and I'm going to make this way bigger because I was told yesterday that it was not big enough. So this is uh, this is a notebook that I have shared with all of you, and this is a very uh, extensive notebook that will show you how to do a number of things with the Chandrasource catalog. So the Chandrasource catalog, remember, is the collection of all of the sources that you have in the Chandra mission collected from the beginning of the mission up to now, basically. And uh, that contains the properties. So we've measured the fluxes, we've measured the hardness ratios, we've measured the variability, we've measured the spectra of all of those sources. And now you guys have access to that catalog and you can right away start doing science with it if you just follow this notebook, okay? So basically uh, this notebook uh, uses a number of uh, installations that you will need to install. So it uses PyVO. PyVO is uh, a tool that allows you to explore astronomical data sets from, from, uh, from, uh, from your Jupyter notebook. A Chao is the tool that we use to analyze uh, Chandra data. So for example, to fit spectra or to uh, create an image from an event file, et cetera, et cetera. That's the software we use. AstroPy, some of you who work with Python might be familiar with AstroPy that gives you a number of tools uh, for the treatment of astronomical data. And for those of you, and this we will not touch on today, but uh, on Friday, on the last lecture, uh, we I will briefly show you how to input some data from the Chandrasource catalog into a machine learning algorithm in scikit-learn. So basically that's it. And uh, this is just uh, some of the imports that we need here. And I'm going to move uh, uh, to show you how to do a couple of things. Uh, the important things here is really how to search for sources in the Chandrasource catalog. So if you are looking for a particular source in uh, the uh, Chandrasource catalog, or you're interested in getting a bunch of sources in a particular galaxy, or you're interested of getting all the X-ray sources in the Orion Nebula, you can do that directly from the Chandrasource catalog using this notebook, and you'll, uh, and you'll be able to actually get all the properties from those sources. So I will show you how to use a con search for finding those sources. Uh, and then I will show you how to do a little bit more complex searches uh, using a particular service. For example, if you want to uh, obtain the properties of sources that have been observed more than once by Chandra, but you only want to get the properties for one particular observation of that source, you can also do that. Uh, and then I will show you uh, how to download products, data products from the CSC2. And products can be, for example, the spectra of, of, of a particular source, 
or the like curve that shows you the variability of that source or, or a bunch of many, many other uh, products that we have in the Chanda source catalog, okay? So let's start with the basics. Let's start with doing a con search. So suppose you want to get all the X-ray sources uh, that live in the galaxy M33. M33 is a beautiful spiral galaxy with a lot of star formation going on. And of course, because there's a lot of star formation going on, then you expect to have uh, a bunch of X-ray sources there because as I said, uh, star forming regions are a common place for uh, a common you know, kind of location in which you would find X-ray sources either because they are young stars or because they are X-ray binaries. So in fact, this is a visualization in ESA Sky. Actually, ESA Sky. If you Google ESA Sky, you will get uh, a, this beautiful visualization of astronomical data that you can play with. And this is just a visualization of uh, M33. And every point here is actually a source in the Chanda source catalog. So we have every single point here will correspond to an X ray source. Many of them, I am going to guess, are X ray binaries. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So uh, the first thing is you can very easily do this search in the Chandrasas catalog. This is just a visualization. I haven't done anything with data here yet. So I am going to use AstroPy to define the coordinates of my object. And my object, the cool thing about AstroPy is that I can provide uh, the name of the source and it will identify the coordinates of the source. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to look around M33. And I am going to use a, a radius of one uh, degree. So that's more or less uh, the size of this, of this image here. It's about one degree wide. So I am going to do a search of the catalog centered on my galaxy and with a radius of one degree. All right. So that what this creates is a coordinate object. So you see then if I now print it, now I have the coordinates of my object. And that's great because then I don't have to worry about where M33 is. I already have it from AstroPy. And now I am going to do a con search. A con search is just basically doing a circular search around a position with a particular radius, right? And we provide a con search, con search service uh, as part of uh, the Chandrasos catalog release. So if you use the PyVO tool that we imported earlier here, uh, this tool, the PyVO that I have imported at VO, you can use our con service, con search service, to actually don't, don't do the search. So you first define the con service. This is just basically the location of what where our service is. Uh, you, can, you can get some help about what the con service is by doing help con search. I'm not gonna stop there. Uh, but then all you have to do is you have to say, okay, the results, which are going to be a table, are going to be my con search, which will be centered in the position of M33 and will have the radius that I defined earlier that was one degree. This parameter, verbosity, will only tell you, this will, this will do a search for the sources in the channel source catalog. And in principle, it will give you all the properties for each of those sources. So fluxes, hardness ratios, variability, uh, significance, likelihood, et cetera, et cetera. So it will, give you, it will give you a very long table, but you can control if you don't want all of the properties there, but you only uh, want the basic ones, you can change verbosity to two, or to one, and then you will get less and less columns, right? So if I look at what the results come up to be, it turns out to be a table of about 750 objects. So that's the total number of objects that we found uh, in, uh, in M33 that are X-ray sources. And then you can always print them. You can print the results, then you will have the name of your source, uh, the right ascension, declination, et cetera, et cetera. And you have a table with all the information for those for those objects. Here I'm just printing some of the properties that you have in that table. So that's uh, name, uh, location. That's the error, the positional errors of the source. How well do we know the position of the source in the sky? The galactic coordinates. Uh, this is a flag that indicates whether your source is variable uh, spectrally. These are properties of whether the source is extended or not extended, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So you will, have, you will have a bunch, and this is only 50 of the properties. It's, it's a very long table, but you can always select which field you want of your table. Uh, and you can also uh, you know, print just a few of those properties for a few sources. So here, 
have uh, just uh, printed the uh, the names and the fluxes and the flux errors for a bunch of them. All right. So, so suppose you want to do plots of these properties. So now you have a table, and that table will be each of the each of the sources around M33 and all the properties. For example, the fluxes, the harness ratios, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you suppose you want to do uh, you want to do a plot of uh, where those objects are and how significant they are. So significance, you can understand that as a signal to noise of in the X-ray regime. So you're basically going to say, okay, of all these objects that are here, how many are really, really significant because they really are uh, raised from the, from, the, from the noise level of the detection. And you'll see that there's, there's a broad range of significance in logarithmic scale. And not surprisingly, the source in the middle that is probably the black hole in the center of this galaxy is very significant. It has a very strong X-ray emission. And then some other objects, probably X-ray binaries, will have you know, significances that are considerable because they tend to be the brightest objects in the spiral arm of the galaxy, right? Uh, so, uh, so now let's try to visualize uh, variability and spectral properties. And all I'm doing here is I am going to plot the harness ratios in two different bands. So remember that the hard re harness ratios just will tell you about the, the spectral shape. If they will tell you whether your photons are mostly hard or mostly soft, uh, and and they they can be defined for different bands. So the hard band, the medium band, and the soft band. And all I'm going to do here is I'm going to plot them, right? Uh, uh, the harness ratios, and I am going to color code by variability. We will talk a bit more about variability tomorrow. But all I'm going to tell you now, at this point is that these are the colors here represent the probability that an object is changing its flux in short time scales. And when I say short time scales, I mean the typical time scale of, a, of the duration of an observation with Chandra, which is a few hours, and when they are variable in the long term. And this means months, years, et cetera, et cetera. So you see that. First of all, the distribution of harness ratios will tell you that the sources that are up in this corner tend to be harder. They have hard X-ray photons. They can have, for example, a lot of non-thermal emission that is coming from the power, power law. And the ones that are down here are probably softer and maybe they are more related to thermal emission from black, black body radiation from, from, from the object that we're observing. But on top of that, you can tell which ones are more variable or more likely to be variable. So you can select, okay, I'm going to select only candidates that are very highly variable because I suspect they are low mass X-ray binaries. So you can select by that. And the same you can do for the long-term variability. And this is just a visualization, all right? All right, so this so far all I've been doing here is I've been querying the table of the Chandra source catalog. So if you're interested in a particular region of the sky, you can reproduce this notebook by just changing the coordinates that you defined earlier uh, to, to change your coordinates to your object of interest. And then you'll be able to get the properties, X-ray fluxes, harness ratios, et cetera, et cetera, for your source of interest. So if you're into X-ray astronomy or you, want, or you want to study star forming regions or you just want to do some data science by doing some machine learning with this, you can right away get your data in your not, not Jupyter notebook using this this uh, this uh, tutorial. All right, so let's move on. Uh, and what I wanted to show you next was, uh, you can of course save your data to a table. If you want to save it to a FITS table, you can do that. And that's not necessarily uh, a big thing. This, I am not going to, to spend a lot of time on this part. But this is where you where this is where you will get more sophisticated queries. So, for example, uh, the catalog, as I said, is constructed by stacking observations one over the other. But you can also get the, the properties for individual observations that uh, before they get stacked. So you can use the tab queries that is another service to search the catalog for properties. Uh, uh, at the offside level, so individual observation level. So the, in the tab, you will have all the tables you have. So you will have a master source that is the highest level of the sources, where basically sources are defined based on all the times they were observed. But then there's also tables for the stack, uh, 
So basically, when you just look at the stack, one single stack with many superimposed observations, you can get the tables for the properties using those stacks. And then you can also use the tables for individual observations. And all this part of the notebook is showing you is how to do that. Uh, so for example, here is showing you a distribution of the extended sources, how many of this channel source catalog uh, uh, well, it's just visualizing sources in the Chandra source catalog that are extended, that are not point sources, but are, for example, supernova remnants. And here we are just uh, color coding them by their flux. Uh, and, uh, but you can do many complicated searches. So you use ADQL language to, to select a particular table. And uh, this is just basically uh, ADQL language for doing a search of all of these properties in the master source table and in the observation uh, observation level table, uh, and it will it will give you properties at particular levels of the catalog. But typically, all you want to do to start with is look at the master level, and the master level you will get from the con search that I did at the beginning of the tutorial. So, in principle, unless you're very interested in the details of the Chandra source catalog, you don't need to worry too much about these particular searches. But if you're more interested, please please do reach out and I will help you with that. So for example, here, I've done a plot of the flux versus the, uh, the variability dispersion for a number of obser observation level sources. So this is basically sources that are brighter here. And these uh, sources that are upper here are more likely to be variable. Uh, and here I just did a flux versus significance. So you see there's a correlation there, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a very rich data set here that you can use to, uh, to explore that. So uh, now this is the part that I want you to, to, uh, to pay a little bit more of attention for what comes after. This is retrieving and displaying data products. So apart from all these tables with all the properties, the Chandra source catalog also gives you actual products of analysis. So for example, it gives you the spectra of every single object. It gives you the light curve of every single object. And using your Jupyter notebook, you can actually get the Chandra spectra down and it's basically science ready for you to explore. You can start fitting models to it right away. So I am going to, to show you how to do that. Uh, for that, we use a child tool uh, that it's called Search CSC. So search CSC is just a, a, a Chow tool. And remember, Chow is the analysis tool that we use for all Chandra data. And this particular tool will allow you to search the catalog for particular products. This is how, it's, this is how it search uh, uh, CSC works. First, you import it, of course. And all you have to do here is first, we're going to select a particular source. So you can here, for example, here I'm just selecting some sources that are supposed to be highly variable and I get the coordinates of those sources here because search CSC view will want to know the coordinates of the source you want. So if you wanted this first source, then you could use this uh, set of coordinates here. And those are the ones that you will input to search CSC view. And here's how search CSC view works, search CSC works. So you just have to give the coordinates, right? These are the coordinates of the source then uh, you, uh, you say a radius search, 40 arc seconds would be the search radius for this object. This is, uh, this is going to be the output file where your search will be uh, uh, saved. Uh, and here you, ex you specify the, the directory where you want it to go, which band of which energy band you want the data products for. In this case, the broad band that covers all the way from five, from 0.5 to seven or eight kilo electron volts. And then you're going to say which files you want, which data products you want. In this case, the light curve, the PHA, which is the spectral file. And these are the other auxiliary files for spectra that give you the spectral response of the object. So if you do that, uh, you're going to get uh, basically what this is going to do is it's going to download the light curve, the PAH, uh, and the spectra for the source with these coordinates. And that's exactly what happens here. And then once you download the spectrum, uh, you will be able to, of course, visualize the spectrum. Now, I here, I am using AstroPy to load a particular object, in this case, a spectrum, right? And uh, I am able to also download, uh, here I'm, I'm loading actually the, uh, the light curve here. Uh, here I am going to plot the light curve that I extracted. So once you download, you can just read the spectrum 
and also a plot the spectrum. So here is the spectrum of, a, of an object. So here I'm just loading the one I downloaded. So this is basically going to be one of the spectra, the spectra that I got from it. And I am going to uh, plot it. And in order to plot it, I do a couple of things. First, uh, I, am all, I am going to uh, only visualize counts between 0.3 and 7 kilo electron volts because outside of those regions, I don't trust it very much because the, the response of the instrument is not very strong. And I am also going to bin the counts every 10 counts so that I have less noise in the spectrum. And then when I, when I plot it, this is how the X-ray spectrum of this particular source looks like, okay? So this is how you interact with the Chandra source catalog from a Jupyter notebook in order to A, get tables of properties and B, download and visualize uh, data products. For example, spectra or light curves. The light curve is just telling you how the brightness of this object is changing as a function of time during the observation. And the spectrum, of course, is going to tell you what the distribution of energies of the photons that you've detected are coming from this source. All right, so that's how you get your data products. So what I'm going to show you next is how you uh, do the spectral fitting using uh, BXA, which is a particular Bayesian code to do MCMC sampling uh, using nested sampling that I explained at the end of the lecture. So for that, I am going to move to this other notebook that I shared uh, with you guys and with Esteban earlier today. And again, I am going to make it super big because I don't know if you if you see it. So this, this you can follow this notebook if you want to do spectral fitting uh, of, uh, of X-ray sources using Sherpa and BXA. Sherpa is just the chow, the chow part that deals with modeling of data. So for example, Sherpa contains all the physical models that you can that you can fit to a spectrum. For example, you can fit uh, a black body or a power law or a synchrotron emission model. So Sherpa will give you all those models. And BXA, it's a plugin to Sherpa that will take Sherpa models, take Chandra data and do MCMC sampling using nested sampling to uh, kind of fit the models and provide you with posterior probability distribution for the models etc cetera, etc cetera. all right so again what we're gonna do is remember that the the source i mentioned during the lecture that was an ultra luminous x-ray source uh in uh, in the virgo cluster that i said was a very strange source because it was it lived in a in a in an all population environment etc cetera, etc cetera. okay we're going to try to take the spectrum of that source and we're going to fit it with a couple of spectral models and after we're, we're going to do that, we're going to look at what the distribution of the parameters looks like for those models, given my data, right? So I'm going to look at the posterior distributions of those parameters for each model. And then I'm going to look at the evidence and I'm going to kind of select one particular model over the other based on this exercise. All right. So again, you, we start with some imports. Uh, here we're importing uh, BXA, which is going to do our MCMC sampling. We're also importing Sherpa, uh, the same as before, the coordinates in order to search for objects, PyVO, so that I can I perform the searches, matplotlib for plotting, and uh, tools of the Chao environment to search the catalog. Uh, we do a couple of things first. Uh, we are going to set a statistic. So remember that I... Uh, that I talk about the chi-square uh, statistic today, and I also talk about the cache statistic yesterday. That's basically a measure of how close your data is to your predicted model. Uh, and it can be a chi-square value, or it can be, remember the cache statistic that was di derived directly from the Poisson uh, model? Well, that's exactly what we're doing here. We're going to use a statistic. It's called the chi-squared heralds. And this chi-square is basically appropriate for Poisson objects, for, uh, for a Poisson model, but when the counts are very low. So when we have very low counts, this is a statistic that is suitable. And this directly relates to a particular likelihood. So we're kind of assuming a Gaussian likelihood because it's a chi-square, but we're assuming it in the very extreme case where we have very low counts. We're only detecting a few photons, okay? And here I'm just setting the I'm just setting the analysis the the units of my analysis to energy units because when I have a, when you have a spectrum, you can plot the x-axis in terms of wavelength, 
or in terms of frequency or in terms of energy. So I'm going to do it in terms of energy because that's more meaningful for the X-ray astronomy. And now I'm going to search for my object. Uh, and I know that my object lives close to M86. So I'm going to do a search for arc minutes around M86. Uh, the same as I did before, I'm going to do a con search with this uh, position and this radius. Uh, and uh, I am going to print my table here. My table has actually in this radius, it has 48 objects. So I uh, I, I could know the, the specific coordinates for my source and then I select it or I could select it somewhere else. But I know that my source of interest, the, the, the source we're interested in is located uh, in these coordinates. So I am going to take these coordinates and I am going to pass them to search CSC. And in this case, I am only going to get the uh the spectrum so unfortunately because this is the github version it gets cut out here but this is the same thing i did uh before and i am going to get the spectral files only the pha the pha is basically a histogram of the counts per energy bin or the raw spectrum that this is basically your histogram of how many counts came in which energies right and then the other two files that you download are uh spectral files that help you calibrate your spectrum either because uh, the, the photons will spread in, in, in space in your detector because your detector will have uh, a limiting resolution and also the response that contains the area, the effective area and the quantum efficiency of energy. So for, for, each, for each wavelength, you will have a slightly different effective area. Remember when we spoke about the optics of the telescope, we, we were discussing the effective area that is kind of the area that the photons see as they enter the telescope and then the quantum efficiency that tell you how effectively each photon is actually transformed into a signal in the detector. So we we download those three files, uh, but it, it's just very easy when you download them, it's just gonna get them all of the three. And now you, you, you load the spectrum that you just downloaded here and it's actually going to automatically uh, load the three of them, right? And now we did the, we do the same as before. We we ignore energies that are below 0.5 or above eight uh, elect kilo electron volts. And then when we do subtract here, what we're doing is we're subtracting the background. So we're subtracting the background spectrum. And now we visualize the spectrum. So this is the spectrum of our ULX. Of course, it's a little bit noisier because this object is not as bright. I mean, it's intrinsically very, very bright, but it's far away. So you have a more noisy spectrum. And now all I'm going to do is I am going to use different spectral models to try to come up with possible physical uh, quantities that describe this object. All right. So uh, let's see. So now we're going to set... Uh, the model. So if you're interested in all the models that Sherpa has for spectral fits of X-ray uh, of X-ray bodies, then you can go to this link here that will list all of the different available models uh, that you can use uh, in fits for Sherpa. In particular, the ones that uh, start with X XS are spectral models. So you have a bunch of many, many different models that describe different types of physics. And of course, I did not have time here to describe all of them, uh, but uh, I will at least focus on a couple of them. And now I went back to my notebook. Let's go back to where we were before. So in this case, I am going to test two models. I am going to try to fit my spectrum with a model that is only a power law, so a non-thermal process. And then I am going to fit my model with a, my spectra with a model that is only thermal emission from a black body from the from the accretion disk okay so the way i do that is i set i set my source to this model right and my model is going to be uh the power law this is one of the models that comes from from the sherpa models and i am going to call my power law p1 that's the name of the model and then i am going to absorb it because a lot of material is going to be between the source of the X-rays and us. So we need, and, and, and a lot of photoelectric absorption will happen because basically these X-rays will encounter atoms and they will photoionize those atoms and, and those X-rays will be absorbed so they don't reach us. So there's an absorption law and that's actually why the spectrum, despite being a, a power law in this part, it kind of bends down because there's more absorption at lower energies here. 
All right. So I'm going to do that. So that's going to be my model. Uh, here I am going to set some values for my model. So I'm going to, to set a, a hard minimum for the amplitude of the model. If you if you if you show the model, here's the parameters that the model has. It has basically a gamma and an amplitude. Gamma, this is just a value of reference uh, in energy. But here, what this the, the two important parameters here are the gamma, which is the slope of the power law, gamma and the amplitude, so how far you move up and down. And I'm going to set a, a hard limit to the amplitude, a hard minimum for the amplitude, just for, to avoid numerical problems. And then the other, the other parameter that relates to the absorption model is the amount of uh, the, 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 the density of atomic, the, the density of at atomic hydrogen, uh, because that's going to tell you how much is going to be absorbed. And here I am going to freeze it to a particular value. So I'm not going to fit it because it will add a lot of degeneracy to the problem. And also because we have a pretty good idea uh, as to what the value of NH is towards that region of the sky. In fact, there is I, I provided a link here that will take you to a NASA website that you can use to estimate what the typical value of the atomic hydrogen is towards a particular location in the sky. So I used that tool to decide that this was a, a suitable value for the amount of hydrogen atoms in the line of sight to my object. And so I don't need to fit for it. I just freeze it. Uh, and, uh, and, that's, and, and now I, I show my model. It shows me which parameters are frozen. Of course, the NH I just froze. This reference value is frozen. And the ones I'm going to be fitting for are the amplitude and the gamma. All right? Uh, one nice thing that Sherpa has is that you can use this guess function to get an initial guess of the fit. Uh, so uh, that will uh, that will do a very rough fitting to the to the to the data to get some starting values. Because if you start very far away, you might you might not converge. Remember that your probability distribution is like a mountain, and if you start very far very far from the mountain and you start walking randomly, you might not actually. Uh, see that you know ever reach the, the the top of that mountain, so the guess function will get you closer to the mountain. Okay, and then you show your model again, and here's how we set the probabilistic model with VXA. All right. So why do we need for the probabilistic model? Remember that yesterday we did another tool for probabilistic modeling that was PyMC3 to try to solve the problem of photometry, and in that case all we had was we needed uh, an, uh, uh, an expression for the priors, right? What are your priors? And uh, we wanted uh, an expression also for the likelihood, right? So that's that's basically all we need. You have a prior, you have a likelihood that comes from your data, and you're going to try to extract and sample your, your posterior, right? So the way you do that with BXA is first you name your parameters. It's going to be parameter one and parameter two. Uh, the parameter one is going to be the slope of the uh, of the uh, power law, and parameter two is going to be the amplitude, right? Uh, you don't have to b change anything else because these are the only two that will be fitted. The other ones are fixed. Then you create the list of parameters, right? And here you define your priors as a as a, as a list, right? And your list is going to create uniform prior for parameter one and a log uniform prior for parameter two. So here you have a lot of flexibility. These priors can also be Gaussian. These priors can have many different shapes. Uh, I am going to use rather uninformative priors here. It's just going to be flat, uh, a flat prior for the first parameter and a flat prior in the logarithmic space for the second parameter. So I'm, I'm just going to use those priors. But if you know more information, for example, you have an independent measurement of the total brightness of this object that makes you believe that the amplitude should be between certain values, you can always use a Gaussian prior, for example, and say, okay, I'm going to use a Gaussian prior that is more likely, that will give you more, more uh, probability for certain values uh, where I expect the amplitude to be with respect to others. But in this case, I am only doing uh, uniform priors. Uh, and here you create your function that will be the function that you will be 
uh, the, 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 the prior functions that will be uh, generated from your priors. That's just basically the functions that will be sampled over when we are doing the, uh, the MCMC. And all you have to do, I mean, the theory, you might have found the theory a little bit complicated with all this Markov chain and then uh, and then the nested sampling that you only sample the likelihood uniformly at a particular level, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's all kind of under the rug here. And all you need to do is I am going to create a solver that is uh, for this prior function, for my parameters, and I want you to save my outputs in this particular directory. And when you do that, uh, what's going to happen is once you, you run this solver is uh, BXA will run a nested sampling MCMC to sample your posteriors. And that's all you, you, you will have to, 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 to think about. Uh, and this is the output of that sampling. And interestingly, it gives you the logarithm of the evidence. And that's important. That's important because nested sampling allows you to calculate that evidence as you sample and you can use that evidence to compare from one model to the other. So whatever has the highest value of the evidence is probably what you want, right? So we've done that. Uh, this is a visualization of the two parameters and it kind of gives you an idea of the histogram here. But then you can plot your, your you, can, you can, using Sherpa, you can also plot your fit. And this is your best fitted absorbed power law model to the spectrum of this ULX. Uh, and in fact, if you go to, uh, let me see, to my outputs, which is the directory that I uh, had uh, selected. I think it's, it was outputs 30, I believe. Uh, and you try to uh, look at what's in there, you will see that there will be everything. It will be the chains. So basically your Markov chain for all the different parameters. There will be some uh, summary of the results and there will also be a plot, a plot <coughs> that shows you the, the posterior for the two parameters that you just fitted. So here is a visualization in a corner plot here is the, the joint probability, right? It shows you the contours that tell you where the parameters are more likely. So this is your final posterior. Every point there is actually a sample that you got from the MCMC. And this is indicating you the uncertainty in both the amplitude and the, and the slope of your fit. And here we have the marginalized posteriors for each of those. Remember we spoke about marginalized posteriors is basically you shrink this 2D uh, distribution into 1D in each of these axes and you get the uncertainties for the particular model. So this is uh, exactly how you want to visualize your results. All right, so we've done that for the model that was uh, only a power law model. Uh, and we got this nice fit and we got some parameters and we also got an evidence for that model. So what if, what if I don't believe that this is the right model and I actually believe that a disk model is more appropriate? So what if I think that most of the X-ray emission is actually coming from black body radiation uh, from my disk? I can also test that hypothesis here and I'm going to do exactly the same as I did before uh, but in this case, I am going to use a disk black body model instead of an or instead of a power law model. And again, because those X rays can be absorbed by the atoms uh, in the in the environment, then I also need to create uh, and you know absorb this model. Uh, again, I set a hard minimum for the normalization of the black body radiation. Uh, and here's my model. Uh, again, I am this in this case, the parameters of the model, remember, the, the most important one will actually be the only parameter that, that cares, that matters for the, um, for the black body radiation would, would be the temperature, the temperature, the internal temperature of the disk. Remember the disk is hotter in the internal part. Okay, that's the temper, that's the region of the disk that is going to emit the X-rays. And I am going to uh, try to guess, uh, to try to infer the temperature uh, in the internal part of the disk using this model, right? Again, I just built my parameter using uh, uh, my, my formulation here. Parameter one will be the temperature of the disk. Parameter two will be the normalization. 
and I do uh, I create this list of parameters, create my priors. Again, I am going to use uniform prior uh, here and a log uniform prior here. One one important thing that uh, someone asked the question yesterday is is your can your prior completely bias your result? Yes, I mean. Here, I think we have enough X-ray photons to make this exercise. But if you have a source that has very, very slow, very, very low number of photons, and your spectrum is like only a few points, and you're going to try to fit that, and you and you use a very strong prior here, like a Gaussian prior, like very, very picked for a particular value, then you will be completely dominated by your by your prior because you don't have enough evidence to update that prior, and so the model will be. Uh, forced to kind of agree with your prior rather than updating with new evidence. So you have to be careful. But in this case, that's that's one reason to use priors that are less informative, especially in cases where you have uh, a smaller amount of information. Uh, but in this case, I think we have enough enough cases that we could even uh, use a Gaussian prior and, and, and it, it will not be very different. Uh, again, you solve this. And uh, again, uh, all you do is, uh, again, you do your uh, nested sampling. This is all you need to do to do your nested sampling. Remember, all we're doing here is we're taking a likelihood. We're, we're plugging a prior. We get a posterior. And because that posterior can be very complicated, we're sampling from it using MCMC. And we're getting the best representation of that posterior based on, on my samples. And this is what I get. Uh, so uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, the temperature that I am getting, uh, 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 about 0 0.62 or whatever. This is the fit. And of course, uh, we also get the evidence. And in this case, log of the evidence, uh, it's a 10 to the minus 77. If you compare with the evidence that I got before, which model do you think uh, does better in fitting this model? Well. The evidence is, of course, larger for this case because this is logarithmic. This is a logarithmic measure, and this is 10 to the minus uh, this. So uh, this, uh, whereas the other one is 10 to the minus 77, this evidence is larger than the other one, which means that in between this, between these two models, I would select this one as a better, uh, a better uh, case for my for my fit. So uh, if you actually look at my outputs again. Uh, but for the fit, 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 for the fit using the, the disk, then again, you can get your corner plot that shows you your fit, uh, in this case, for the new model. And you see that in this case, there's an interesting degeneracy between the temperature of the disk and the normalization. So that's probably why this model is less favored by the evidence, because there, there's, there's some kind of correlation between the two parameters. And even though you can determine a region, you know, the temperature here is between, uh, you know, 0 0.9 or so uh, kilo electron volts, then you, uh, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that, that there's this degeneracy that could affect the, the, uh, the, uh, the interpretation of this particular model. So, in fact, if you look at the paper that I, that I, uh, that I cited earlier, when I referred to this very interesting object, the values that the authors get uh, for the temperature of this, the power law, et cetera, et cetera, are very similar to this. But these ones are much better constrained because we have the full information of the prior. The authors of the paper did not use BXA. They just used a simple optimization without doing proper sampling. So they get some kind of symmetric error bars, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas here, we've completely characterized uh, the probability uh, of the of the prior and the posterior. So this was the exercise for today. Uh, what comes next is I use a combination of the two models. If you want to try that one, uh, in the last part of this of this exercise, you're you're free to to look into what happens if you actually combine the power law with the disk, and you're welcome to try that. But what I wanted to show you here is that it's absolutely doable for you to do this kind of cool discoveries because you have a very rich data set, the Chandra source catalog that has thousands and thousands of sources. And for those sources, you have science ready tables that, that will list all the properties for all these sources. And you also have products that are ready. You don't have to worry about reducing the spectra, nothing. You just load it uh, 
uh, into your Python session and you're ready to do spectral fitting with it and visualization of the spectrum. So I encourage you to try that. If you are particularly interested in any particular region of the sky or certain types of systems, you know, AGNs or quasars of star forming regions, get some data from the Chandrasaw catalog, visualize the spectra, try to think which models are good fits for those uh, uh, objects and try to and try to fit the spectra with it. And please come back to me with any questions. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, I, will, I will take questions. Tomorrow, we will talk about variability. Variability is another very important thing in, in astrophysics, X-ray astrophysics, but in general, in astronomy, in general, all of what's happening currently has to do with objects that suddenly change brights because they explode because that's a supernova or because there's a kilonova. And we are getting better at identifying those variable objects in the X-ray world as well. So I'll talk a little bit more about variability tomorrow. I will show you a few light curves, how to extract a light curve uh, from a Chandra object and how to study variability, again, in the context of X-ray binaries and in the context of these very interesting massive objects that suck up all of this matter and transform it into x-ray energy. So that's what I had for today. Uh, Esteban, let me know if there are any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, no, at this point, there are no questions. I think they are following you on, on the GitHub, trying to see the, the relevant keys of the exercise you just did. And uh, maybe they will come with the questions tomorrow as soon as they do the exercise by themselves. So, yeah, I think uh, I, that... I, I certainly hope that's the case. Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of information there, but there's also a lot of practical things they can try uh, and uh, a few references that can, they can read. If they, if any if anyone really is interested, I know sometimes either you, you feel you didn't follow the lecture and you don't want to ask a question or, or or you are just shy in general but do ask questions I'm, I'm happy to to think about things you could you can try and to other ways in which you can explore the x-ray catalogs and actually do science with it I mean these are things I told you the first day the Chandrasaw's catalog has a lot of serendipitous sources and in, in in principle every single source here could be a discovery and I encourage you to try to do science with this data <clears throat> learn about astrophysics using this data and I'm, I'm happy to help you if you have any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Juan Rafael. Thank you very much for the lecture of today. And uh, so let's uh, see you again tomorrow at the same time as every day during the week. Thank you very much, all of you, for participating, and see you tomorrow. Thank you, Esteban. Thank you all.